I believe in media, so everything right here, and you're gonna be able to sit down and see it in a second. So while you're, now you can sit down. Thank you for playing. Um, I'm about playing well with others, and that we're here to experience God a bit. Um, experiential worship is my passion. I used to be a person who taught exp expositorily through books of the Bible, that's fantastic. But I've always been a person who you symbol, touch, taste, all the different senses, I just didn't have a name for it. So in the last few years, God has given me this great thing of weaving all this craziness together called experiential worship. And I like to share. So if you wanna get in touch with me, I'm Lily Lewin wherever I go. So, um, and I've actually been Lily Lewin longer than I was Lily Sensing, which is a little scary to say out loud. Uh, so check, just tell me where, we, where you were. I don't friend people that I have no idea who they are, just because I would be, I had too, more friend, too many friends. Also, I know I have to create a fan page now. Sorry, I don't have one yet. Um, but anyway, if you say, hey, I was at the Open and Bay Area, I'll be happy to, to be your friend. And then you can see lots of resources because I like to post things like that. So if you come and become a friend on lilylewin.com, you can get some free Advent resources, just a free plug. Um, all right. So in front of you, we're going to stop a second because um, I want to go really fast because I have so much I want to talk about. Um, in fact, my time really won't start until right now because now I'm going to set my timer. And yay. Okay. How many of you know what your learning style is? Just out of curiosity. All right. How many people uh, um, don't have a clue what I'm talking about? All right, cool. Um, everybody learns a different way. Um, some people learn through their ears, those are auditory learners. Some people learn through a touch, kinesthetic learners. Some people learn um, visually, I'm one of those. Um, when I sit in church, listening to people talk, this is what I do. I do not learn just through my ears. I take notes by drawing. I started getting people to bring art supplies to church because why do little kids get to have art supplies in church and big people don't? So I want to be able to draw in church. But somehow we figured out that we should throw things away, like drawing and in the Reformation, we threw out all the artists and we threw out all the symbols and we threw out all the cool stuff. And then we let all the new age people have all the really cool stuff because we weren't supposed, we were supposed to be about up here, we weren't supposed to be about holistic things. But as far as I know, Judaism was very holistic and Judaism is an Eastern religion and that's where we come from. So it's okay to be about feelings and touchiness and stuff like that, so don't get scared. All right. What is worship? I used to be a part of a vineyard. I know how to worship like this for 45 minutes and sing hallelujah 2,500 times in a row. But when I got to this little Episcopal church in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, went from a staff of 99 to a staff of four, I realized my students did not speak my language. I had to learn an entirely new language of worship. Worship wasn't just 45 minutes of standing like this and singing. Worship should be everything that we do. We should be worshiping God all the time. How many people experience God outside? Show of hands. That's, that's your thin place. That's the place you go and you connect with Jesus. I want to be out there on the hill. I want to be out there having this time out there. That's where I connect with God, outside. Um, how many people, when they fell in love, they didn't sing a song to them, to your whoever you were falling in love with. I remember creating a Valentine in eighth grade for a guy named Hunter Ridgway. Hunter Ridgway went to the boys school where I lived and I went to the girls school and I just, he was in my youth group and I was in love. That's how I got to youth group. It was all because of a boy. Anyway, I created a Valentine that was a collage of all the different words and sayings and pictures that made me think of Hunter. I'm sure he thought that was, you know, just pukey. Um, but that's how I expressed my love how part of how I express my love to God now is through art and through creativity. So if we're gonna tell people that worship is just singing, then we've just kicked out all the people who hate to sing. So we gotta define worship in a new way. All right, in front of you on your chairs, we've got some duct tape. Um, when I create sacred spaces, I was telling somebody today earlier, I fly a lot, I go around and create sacred spaces for a living. <laughs> And people say, so what do you do for a living when you're sitting on an airplane? Well, I used to say I was a youth pastor and people just go back to reading or they put their headsets on and they just totally tune me out. So now I either say I create sacred spaces or I say, well, my job is to make church less boring. 
And then people kind of look at you funny. Because if they don't go to church, you know, have any kind of church relationship at all, they think church is way boring. So what do you do to make church less boring, they want to know. Well, I believe in using everyday things to pray and worship with. And I also believe in creating these sacred space places where you get to engage God on your own terms because we're really good at filling up our brains with information. And we can all, because we have these things, not everybody, like you said, has smartphones, but because we have these things, you can get the best speaker in the world on your phone. You don't need me to preach anymore. You got it here. You can go on YouTube and listen to it. So if I want to tell the story of God, A, I'm going to have to do it in a totally different way, and B, I'm going to have to help people learn how to engage God the way they relate to him. All right, so in one of the things I do when I create a sacred space, and if we had a beautiful, like, long day together, I would have stations around the room, and one of those stations would be a confessional, because I don't remember the gentleman's name who was talking about confession. We are really bad at that at confessing our sins. I don't believe in confessing so much straight out to each other, but I do believe in taking time to confess to God. So you have a duct tape confessional in front of you. So I'd like you to take your piece of duct tape and I would like you to fold it in half. And in a perfect world, we'd pass these around and everybody would have time to do it. And we'd also have Sharpie markers because I totally believe in Sharpie markers. I should have stock. So fold them together like this, so the squishy, so the sticky sides are together. And I would like you to hold them in your hand any way you want to hold them. But I'd like you to close your eyes. And I'd like you to hold that duct tape and think about all the things that keep you stuck in your life right now. All the things that are keeping you afraid, or keeping you stuck in your relationship with Jesus. And if we had Sharpie markers, I would actually get you to write these things on your piece of duct tape. But since we don't, I'd just like you to picture that duct tape holding all the stuff, all that junk that is keeping you stuck. Maybe it's, I have too many things to do to be here today. Maybe it's somebody sick at home. Maybe it's, man, I wish I had a new job, or I don't have anything to do with youth group on Sunday night. But I want you to put all those things on the duct tape. And when you leave this afternoon, or when you go through, uh, out to go to the restroom, we're gonna have put them in the manger. Because the first time I did it, you can open your eyes. We're gonna give those to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, when the first time I did this, it was from Matthew 2. Matthew 2, if you know the Bible, is when the wise men come to Herod. And Herod says, they go because they've been following the star and they don't, know where, they don't know where the king of the Jews is supposed to be born. Well, Herod has all these wise people of his own, and he goes, hey, where is this king supposed to be born anyway? And where do they say? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the least of these. Oh, cool, let's go to Bethlehem. Did it ever bother anybody that no one else went? All these wise people who've been studying scripture for years, and they know that the king of the Jews is supposed to be born in Bethlehem, and yet we don't have a written record that anybody left? They were stuck in the palace. So you need an Advent thing? Why, why don't we go worship? Why don't we follow the star? Because we're stuck at home in the palace doing something else. All right. Worship could be this way. That's traditional worship to me in a frame. It's a beautiful picture. Everybody can tell what it is. I went, used to go to the Cincinnati Art Museum as a part of our church community. And I don't like contemporary art. I'm pretty a traditionalist. But God took me to this room. And I think our contemporary worship kind of can be like that frame with the square in it or the rectangle. Well, then God goes, what if it's worship? What if worship's this way? I was like, well, is that even art? You know, there's part of me that wants to say that. Um, I know better than that as an art student. But this is art. It's still, I mean, it's just worship. It's still canvas. It's still paint. It just doesn't have a frame. So what I do is called free range worship. It's like, let's take the things of God and create spaces and places for us to worship using all the senses and all the elements possible. Um, another piece of the title of my, um, of my talk was supposed to be curation. So when someone says, what do you do? Um, if I'm in a Christian circle, I say I'm a worship curator. I'm a worship leader who doesn't play guitar, piano, or anything else. A worship curator 
since I now know names in this room, I can, I can play on people. All right, a worship curator, my job is if you're my youth group or if you're my community or my congregation, I want to know you well enough to know what your gifts are. I want to know how, um, how are you wired? What's the way that you express um, your talents and abilities? Who are you? And if I find out that you're somebody who writes a lot, like you're a poet or you do slam poetry on the weekends, whatever, I want you to be a part of my worship service. So what if you got that writer person to come read a poem instead of a hymn or a song? What if you got another person who might not ever stand up in front of people, but might be able to write an opening worship piece? Like a prayer we pray all together. Because I was a prayer hog in youth group. I'm not afraid of being up here in front of you. This is like, I have fun doing this. But there are people who like would never pray out loud and hate to pray out loud. And my youth group at junior high, we used to not even hold hands. We'd hold feet. We'd touch each other's feet in a circle. But to get rid of the prayer hogs, if we all pray together in one, if we all use um, a prayer that say that Ben wrote, Ben wrote the opening prayer. Hey, I know Ben. Let's all pray Ren's opening prayer together or closing prayer. Or um, whoever the music people are, set them up ahead of time and say, hey, would you look on iTunes and find a, find a song that goes with Falling the Star? Or find a song that goes with Thanksgiving? Um, it could be the Charlie Brown theme, because people who've actually seen the Charlie Brown holiday special, those of us who are over 35, um, uh, they actually know that tune, and they would get that tune. So curation involves finding different people who have different gifts and letting them share. Instead of going out, I used to, once upon a time, steal you know, photographs off the internet rather than taking them myself or getting any of my students to take them. Now that everybody has a smartphone with a photo possibilities endlessly on this, get them to take pictures, but give them the theme ahead of time. So that if you're making something slideshow, even if it's gonna throw songs on it, it should have a picture that somebody in your youth ministry took or somebody in your congregation took. So, great, I have one minute and 37 seconds, at least for the first set. So, I create spaces like this where people get to go speak and be with God by themselves. This was at Greenbelt over in England this, um, this summer. And the reason I chose this slide is because I like to create things myself. This has become my expression to God. So when I got invited to come create a chat prayer space in Greenbelt, I was like, Oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to create these stations. It's going to be so cool. Well, then I found out I had this really crappy room. It was the ugly space, one of the uglier spaces I've ever created in. And then I find out the great guy that invited me to do this, he already had half of it done before I even get there. And I was like, how is this a gift? Because part of me wanted to go, man, I had this whole idea, and now it's going to be different. Then God kind of, hey, you're a worship curator, aren't you? You're supposed to use the gifts of the people that are around you. What well, turns out that one of my good friends who now lives in New Mexico is a photographer. And he had just posted a whole bunch of photographs on his site. And he said, I'm doing contemplative photography now. Here's some stuff. I emailed him and I said, hey, I would love to buy your stuff and use it as a, as a, um, a meditation in the prayer space I'm doing at Greenbelt. And he said, you don't have to buy it. Just give me credit. I was like, sweet. So the whole back wall of this space was pictures like this that DG took. And it just made the space. Then, if you look at the tent, I would have never not used neon anything in a prayer space. That's just not my style. But my friend Martin's daughter is in uh, school, in college, in art school. And she, I still have three minutes, um, she designed this really cool, she took old CDs and broke them apart. That's what's on this cross. And it was a whole reflection station. And I had written some stuff on reflection. So that was what you stood in front of the cross and thought about your brokenness and how you reflect God. And then the, the tent was kind of this little prayer pod, and her dad is really into lasers. So we had these laser lights in there. Seriously, I would have never used laser in a prayer space, but somehow because it was, it, God worked it all together and wove it all together. And all I did as the curator was written, I wrote some stations and some meditations to go around and interact with the stuff that was really already there. That was my job as curation. But honestly, it took a lot for me to see that as a gift because I wanted to, there were so many other things I really wanted to do. Okay, there's so many things I could talk about, about using all different things to create prayer spaces. Um, I'll skip that. That was where I started out in church, and then I ended up in church in a coffee house. So the last thing I would like to do is the plate that is under your chair. 
and the plate that is under your chair is a response to John 21. If you know John 21, John 21 is also known as the breakfast at the beach. That's the neon uh, cross that was in the prayer space at uh, Greenbelt. I'm going to go fast. So John 21 is breakfast at the beach. I, I really think that no one knows the story anymore. I don't assume that anybody knows this is a post-resurrection story. So if I was going to create an experiential station response on this, I would have a station that said who Peter is, who the disciples are, and this is post-resurrection. Because I don't assume anyone's read the rest of the book. Um, but being in a place like California where we could actually have, a, we could go out there to the coast and actually have this. I had somebody um, this spring, not spring, this fall, say, hey, I was at a workshop where you talked about this. We actually did it. We took our whole church down to, the, down to the coast, and we actually created the breakfast at the beach. And when we decided we need to do this more often, because we need to have the people who go to the beach instead of going to church come and be a part of our breakfast. I was like, that's the perfect thing to do. So when you look at a passage of scripture experientially, the concept is what are the touch, taste, smell, what are the natural elements present in that space? What I usually ask teachers is, or pastors, what do you want the students or your congregation or whoever's listening to you, what do you want them to take away? What do you want them to remember? Because we don't remember what we hear, we remember what we do. So you're going to do a corporate response to John 21. The story goes, if you refresh your memory, is they, the, Peter's like, okay, I'm just going to go fishing. Who wants to go with me? They all go fishing because that's what they know how to do. So they go fish. They can't, don't catch anything all night. They see this guy on the beach. Peter, go, John says, hey, I think it's the Lord. Peter dresses himself again and jobs in. Don't ask me why. And swims to the, swims to the beach. And they, Jesus doesn't need his fish. They, they catch all these fish, but Jesus doesn't need them. Jesus already has the breakfast cooked on the beach. He already has the fish. Jesus is already providing for us. We don't need to worry about what's happened on Sunday night at youth group or Wednesday night at youth group. Jesus is already ahead of us. He already knows what's going to happen. He knows what's happening this afternoon. So on that lovely plate, I would like you to write down three ways that God has already provided for you in the last month. How has God already provided for you? So take, see if you have your pencil out, go, if you don't have your pencil out, you can do it in a second. How has God already provided for you? And in a perfect world, we'd have longer to do this. I'd have you flip over the, the plate. How do you need him to provide for you? It's getting ready to be holiday season. In my lovely church, we used to call that hell season because it was not always fun to be if on a church staff, especially if you're a liturgical church, um, to be in the middle of the holiday season, especially if Christmas Eve turned out to be right before a real Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve fell on a Sunday, then you had to do seven services or something insane. So on the flip side of your plate, so on the first front side, how has God provided for you? On the back side, how do you need him to provide for you? And then we'll give those to Jesus. In a perfect world, we'd have the music playing that would sound, or ocean sounds, so we'd create the space and hear, hear the ocean. We might be outside. We might actually have a fire pit that has a fire in, going in it, so we're around the fire. We might actually cook some fish um, so that you could actually taste you know, taste the fish cooking, or somebody, you know, in a perfect world, I'd get robbed to cook breakfast for everybody. That's my husband, who's the chef. But we have Swedish fish for you guys. <laughs> because Jesus provides, you can pass them around. But use everyday things that people are going to see again. Because the next time you see fit Swedish fish, I don't want you to think candy and gummies and boy, do I love them. I want you to think, Jesus provides for me. He provides me everything I need. He cooks breakfast ahead of time, even when I've caught all the fish. And I do believe my time is really up now. So I would love to talk more to you about how to do this in real life. Um, find me on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you for letting me share my gift with you today. And when you leave, definitely give, put your t duct tape in the manger and give all that crap to God and let him carry all the stuckness away. So you're not going out the door today carrying anything, but carry and know that God is providing for you. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs>